It is a great pleasure to um, have our Rachel here tonight. Um, the world places that we bump into each other on our own country and um, had a couple with her at her house and basically tested her ever since to um, come and speak tonight. So um, it's really, uh, really great to have a 200 people in the house, so um, probably a first for the University of Melbourne. Um, so I just want to acknowledge the country, the uh, nation's country, people of the Kulin Nation. Um, never exceeded their country, and we, we appreciate that we can be here on, the, on their lands. Um, also, I want to acknowledge the guests tonight. Um, there's many guests here from indigenous organisations, um, including First People Assembly of Victoria, um, the Europe Justice Commission, and the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Services, as well as many others who um, work in those spaces. And um, we would welcome you all coming and um, joining us tonight to um, speak with our great here. Also, I just want to acknowledge there's a lot of um, mob out there on, on the um, online listening, so I just want to welcome you all for coming in. And um, you know, it's really awesome that we can now um, get in online and speak with you all. So we're really appreciative. Um, we're having some dramas with our IT, but um, we're hoping that we're going through and everything's okay. So, Rachel Perkins, everybody, can you just give it a round? You've done family sis, so don't worry. Um, so, for those who don't know, and probably that, that'll be hardly anyone um, in the country, Rachel Perkins is an Aranda Kalkadun filmmaker with a 30 year career. Um, she directed the first series of Total Control and Mystery Road, and her movies include Jasper James, Marbo, the musical hit uh, Brand New Day, um, One Night, The Moon, and Radiance. Uh, her TV work includes Red Fern Now, the landmark documentary series First Australians and the Australian Wars. In 92, she founded Black Collar Films, one of Australia's leading creators of Indigenous screen content. And she's basically just sold it as well, as you understand. Because <laughs> <laughs> they keep bringing me. <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> Uh, in the cultural heritage space, Rachel's worked alongside Aranda women to sustain their song traditions. In the national arena, she led the preparation of a, of a vision for Indigenous heritage, Dara and Nigni, yeah. yeah. uh, across all jurisdictions in 2020. She currently co-chairs the First Nation Heritage Protections Alliance Joint Working Group with the Commonwealth on National Indigenous Heritage Legislative Reform. She has served on numerous NGO and federal agency boards and was a founding board member of the National Indigenous Television Service. Uh, Rachel is a signatory to the Uru Statement from the Heart and is co-chair of Australian for Indigenous Constitutional Reform, which leads the Yes Alliance. Um, so yeah, that's uh, Rachel. <laughs> Read out your CV. No, that's, <laughs> that's, no one wants to get that. Um, <laughs> and they all know who you are. So, I suppose just, just for everyone out there, there's a bit of trigger warning. Um, we were talking about Rachel's work, um, really brave work, including her latest series, The Australian Wars, uh, which deals with important truth telling about the frontier warfare, um, massacres, and colonial violence. Um, so, please take care of yourself and each other. So in saying that, um, I'll get onto some questions and at the end we'll have Q and A for um, everyone out in the audience. So um, make sure they're hard for Rachel. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's Friday night and we really need to come up with So just can I just say for this, um, it's really great to have you here. And um, Janelle was really panicking because we hadn't heard from you. <laughs> and I just said, listen, that's, that's us, my brother. We're on 100,000 boards and we all kind of spread ourselves thinly. And, but you're here, sis, and um, like I said, you'll be here. Um, thank you for coming. Uh, we 
coming for a trade tonight, everybody. Um, as you walk through the door there, you would have seen the dad on the on the wall there. And I, I get the opportunity to talk to students all the time, and I say, you know, when I was doing law, I after first year law, I just had enough. I couldn't hear what they were saying anymore, and, and, and it didn't replicate what my mom were getting from the legal system, right? But if I was able to see pictures like that. And there's other pictures throughout the law school in classrooms and out of, um, you know, who, uh, times like um, Sir Doug Nichols and, and various other real, um, real moments in, in, in Indigenous history that really would really make you think that, you know, how people and you know, Uncle Dave who just got through and made things better for all of us to be in places like this. So it's it, it, it's really. And, and that's like your films, right? They, they inspire. The last one I, I watched and I thought, you know, this is really something that our law students should be watching. So I just want to thank you personally. So in saying that then, um, Rach, um, can you tell everyone here, who are you, who's your mom, and what's the values that drive you in your work? Um, well, firstly, I want to thank you, Eddie and Janaya, for having me here. I really appreciate being in this space and thank you all for coming out on a Friday night. There's a lot of better things to do than, you know, be here. So um, I appreciate you giving us your time. And um, and I acknowledge the work that Janae and Eddie are doing here and bringing Aboriginal experience um, to loyal students um, at this prestigious school. Um, very important to have, um, you know, our lawyers coming through exposed to issues of Indigenous people and our nation. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm Aranda as well, like Eddie, and, um, and Kalkadu, uh, so Aranda Nation is around Alice Springs, Kalkadu is around Mount Isa area, and um, I've also got um, German and Irish heritage, and uh, I um, started as a filmmaker when I was 18 at a place called the Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association, it was set up by one called Frida Gwynn and others, and um, yeah, I've been making films ever since. And uh, we were trained very, very, uh, we didn't have training, we just we had to do it. But <laughs> Rita gave us a great grounding in our purpose. And she sort of said, your purpose is to go out and serve your people and the nation, although that sounds very like, uh, I don't know, self-important or something. But she saw that media was um, a vehicle for us to talk through and um, to you know maintain our cultural heritage and reassert ourselves in the contemporary world, and so we were very much in, grounded in that philosophy, and um, so that's what I've been doing just um, for the last thirty years. And um, so, what else about myself? Um, I go between Alice Springs and Sydney, and yeah, at the moment I'm taking the year off to work on this uh, referendum. Because it needs all hands on deck. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, you and your siblings, and I, we bump, like I said, we bumped into you in Alice Springs with Aunt Teddy. Yep. Um, you grew up with a real training and effective advocacy for our Indigenous rights. Uh, and our audience entered this place walking past you. Dad did. Um, and, and the others with him that wrote on freedom rights, um, you know, with Dad and then challenged the, and raised awareness of the policies of segregation around New South Wales. Um, and he, then he worked his way up the Commonwealth Department of Aboriginal Affairs, and, 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 and your dad had his, his own style, right? very bold, and um, in his activism and speaking out at public, as a public servant, uh, he was notable. Uh, put intention and, and certain things in government on notice. Um, how did that impact you growing up and, 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 it, and impact on your work? Um, well, I think that um, Dad uh, was Charlie Perkins and he um, uh, was the third Indigenous person to go to university and he did that very deliberately to sort of empower himself with the language of power, actually because he knew that that's why he wanted to um, shake up the system, 
So um, he uh, was involved in the Freedom Ride, which, um, for those who don't know, was a bus sort of shaped on the American Civil Rights Freedom Ride buses, and he went with a bunch of students around New South Wales, and it became a protest about segregation policies that existed in outback New South Wales and, and of course, right across the country, and it, it made him a national figure very quickly in the 60s, and then he continued to be a national figure. Um, and I think the thing that he, uh, he never settled for the status quo. He wasn't one of those people who just said, oh, well, this is just the way our lot is in life and we have to take it. Or this is the way the public service should operate and we just have to, you know, follow the, you know, power structures. He never, he, he had a um, healthy um, disregard for um, authority and, and the status quo. So he always felt that he had every right to question, challenge, and change things. And I think the ability that the, the sort of, um, and on their own terms, you know, in an indigenous way. Um, so whilst he had the language of power, he approached it with his other collaborators in a very indigenous way, which, is, which was you know, bringing together the mob, strategizing for change, and then pursuing that. Um, and I think that growing up around change makers, you know, you see the possibility of change, you see how they do it, you know, and, you, and, and it gives you um, the confidence to think, well, we're not going to accept that. You know, we can change that rather than just thinking, oh, this is the way it is. So um, that was inspiring, um, having, uh, having it sort of a, thinking that you can do anything. And I think the other thing that he told us is that, you know, don't accept any limitations on you personally as well. Um, you know, don't think that, um, he used to say, the world's your oyster to whatever you like, and um, accept no limitations. So, and if there's two choices, take the harder one because that'll make you grow. So it was, it was, it was an inspiration for me to be around. And my mother was particularly, you know, she was part of it because the movement flowed through our house. So it was a very, um, it was a partnership to change. And she's at home looking, at <coughs> looking after my son right now so I could be here, you know, it was like, it's like all the families organized to, um, to be able to, Act be active in, in, in the public to create change. So it's, it's very normal for us. And are you still doing it now, right? Yes, well, yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I mean, where did you just come from Sydney, right? Yeah, I just came from Sydney, yeah. Yeah. Um, look, so you spoke about this a little bit, but I just wanted to touch on it. Um, you know, coming from Alice Springs, a lot of things come out of Alice Springs that a lot of people aren't aware of. So, so at 80, you moved back to our country, yeah? Yeah. And, and you took a traineeship at uh -huh. Palmer, Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association, um, which um, had been set up then to tell about Aboriginal stories. Mm -hmm. um, and the legacy of you and your contemporaries trained there, including the director of Warwick Boom. Yep. Um, so, it's a little bit about me now, but <laughs> I also got my training in law and governance and Aboriginal control organisations, you know, like yeah. through the Aboriginal legal services and, and through ATSI. Um, and, and these organisations uh, provide such important training grounds, not just in craft, but putting craft in the service of Indigenous aspirations. Yeah. Can, you, can you tell us, and you tell us a little bit about your experience, but can you, can you tell us about Karma itself and, and what the experience it gave you and, and what you got out of that? Yeah, it was, uh, we did a three year traineeship. So, yeah, Warwick Thornton um, was the son of Freda Bean who set it up, and there was other filmmakers involved, Eric Bean, also Freda's daughter, and they're all making films. Warwick's in Cannes this week, his latest film. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think, as you say, like, being in an Indigenous organisation, you grow your capabilities in an Aboriginal way, don't you? And, and you can be yourself and be proud of yourself and also you're um, politicised or, or skilled up to work um, in a way that, in an Indigenous sort of methodology, that's what you're referring to. And, that can that takes you through your life. 
that formative age when you get those skills I think that um, that takes you through your life and, and I think the great thing for us is that because we were making programs for the new television station in Paja TV um, we uh, you know we had cameras and we'd go out to communities and so we were filming uh, traditional ceremonies and songs and um, indigenous knowledge basically as a big part of it plus sort of current affairs um, but it gave us, as the camera has continued to do, it's given me access to incredible things that I would have never had access to in my life, potentially. So, you know, having that camera that's guiding me around the place and, um, uh, and recently, yeah, I've used it to, you know, not only work at the mainstream level, of, you know, with um, popularist television programs, but I also use it in my community to document our traditions, our dreamings, um, and our elders' knowledge. So it's it's um it's that great harnessing of that asset to use in different ways that you know we've adapted it, but in a very indigenous, with an indigenous sort of um outlook that's very distinctive. I think very comfortable about the way we do things. You know? now, uh, okay. <laughs> no, I mean the um, the show. That you know, grasped the rules of Parliament. It's a, it was amazing to show. And so far as someone who worked for a national body that walked those places and, and knows those stories, our stories, you know, how and, and how they affect us, that was spot on. Right? And they give they give understanding, I think, to a bigger picture of what we what we go through. Right? And particularly for legal um, people, I think they only see what happens <coughs> one, what they want to see, and, and two, basically in, in those courtrooms, and they don't see the after effects and, and the continued um, sadness and stuff. Recently, we just had a, um, the Eastern Ma people won their land, yes, and um, we we had Jamie Lowe speak to our, our class. and. Um, I literally asked him a question and I, I, I already knew the answer. I'm just historically, the answer would be the same. I asked him, also from the, who are the initial claimants, how many of them are still alive? And he, he was, he could tell you, he broke his head and he said zero. And then that's, that's the usual process of understanding from Indigenous Australians. So, so through your production company, that you founded, um, again, Black Rock Films, you made your most recent part, that three part series, Australian Wars. Um, there are two clear um, forthright titles for projects. Can you tell us about why you chose these titles and what they say about the work? About the Australian Wars? Yeah, um, well, it was going to be called First Wars, that series. It's showing on SBS, I'm not sure who's seen it, but um, let's just see. And uh, three one hours, and yes, it began its life being called First Wars, and then midway through, I was reflecting on the fact that um, there's very little acceptance that colonial violence occurred in the settlement, if you want, or occupation, or invasion, if you want to call it, um, of this country, and. We just haven't really come to terms with it. It's not well known because obviously the education system's failed to give Australians any knowledge of that history, really, um, to date. And so, in thinking about uh, the fact that we will be introducing this content or that story to many Australians for the very first time, and thinking about, well, how do we even talk about it? You know, we need to give people a language to talk about this because it's so new to them. Um, I thought it's good to call it the Australian Wars and get people to start talking about it as something that is ours, distinctly ours, and associated with the nation's birth, and um, give them a, bring it into the vernacular. Because people talk about frontier conflict, colonial warfare, you know, frontier violence. It's sort of got all these loose names, but actually to give it. Some people say you shouldn't dignify it by calling it war because sometimes it's just so one-sided. Um, but 
New Zealand Aotearoa or New Zealand, but also just changed the name of the Māori Wars to the New Zealand Wars. So I thought, well, it's an appropriate title to give the series. So we changed it. Um, who, who's seen it so far? The rest of you, it's on SBS. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I suggest you watch it. Um, so Reconciliation Australia runs uh, their, their barometer survey every two years, and in 2022, it noted that uh, general community continue to believe that key misleading accounts of Australia's colonial past and injustice are factual. Only 63% of the general population survey believe frontier wars occurred across the Australian continent as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people defended their traditional lands from European invasion. These wars took place over 100 years, yet, as you say in the film, history is written by the people. Um, if not by warfare, what do you do the general population believe happened here to establish the Australian nation? And why is it important to you that they understand the truth? Yeah, well, I think um, it goes to the unfinished business we're dealing with today, right? So, you know, that's the thing about history, it's all about the future. Someone said the other day, I can't remember who said it, I'm not really, that's good. I'll steal that. <laughs> um, and so, to understand what's right in front of us at the moment, you know, uh, voice, treaty, truth, that relates back to, you know, something that began 200 more years ago. So it's very important that we understand that past. And I think um, where other countries have come to terms with their past, they manage to um, negotiate the present and the future in a much more um, honest and productive way. So, uh, I mean, I think 65% of Australians' understanding that there's some colonial conflict is quite good, actually, because... I think it was done 10 years ago, so that would be even lower. Um, but I think, yes, it, it gives us the capacity to deal with the future. And um, was that an answer to your question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, we still have huge dramas um, in the law school in reference to, uh, although we talk about Terra Nullis a little bit more, overall, as the legal system of our country has been. Lots of not said it's on shaky grounds yes. on how it's started. Mm. And, and I think that's where we see a lot of our concerns and issues that come from mm. and misunderstanding more about our people and, yeah. and their legal system um, yeah. as real dramas in dealing with our issues. Yes, well, the fact that the High Court, I mean, we know more about this than they've said that it, the sovereignty was. Um, taken by settlement, yeah? And although they said that was wrongful, you know, sovereignty actually can't be taken by settlement, as I understand. But anyway, that's the whole rabbit hole that we want to go down. You guys must talk about it all the time. So I'm not talking about it. Well, they don't technically don't want to talk about it too much, but the um, fracture of the spiritual principle of the uh, justice system, apparently. Yes, well, they, they can't, they can't, um, they can't, UK on, on, UK on that matter, yes, because it falls into question their existence. Yeah. Which is true. So, let's go on more exciting things, but um, one of the things that struck me out of your first episode of the series, um, when you're telling the stories of leaders and resistance fighters such as Benelon and Commonwealth, was the way you focus on the law of Aboriginal nations being extended to the new European arrivals, and you frame this as a conflict of of laws where British law and Aboriginal law collide. Mm. Can, you, can you tell us about some of the choices you made in making this part of the series and how it, how it came about? Yeah, well, that's right. I think, um, and you've written about this, the sort of collision of Aboriginal law and, you know, European law in, in Australia. And I think as Henry Reynolds explains in the series, um, you know, what perhaps the colonists saw as crime or, you know, um, you know, occasional raids or the murderous, you know, tendencies of, you know, the savages, he, he says, well, of course, Aboriginal people were actually um, applying their law um, to the newcomers. So um, whether it was um, access to their own land or whether it was um, access to resources that was on their land or, you know, payback scenarios for other crimes under Aboriginal law, 
um, you have to see um, our response to colonial intrusion as as an act of um, response in, in the framework of Aboriginal law, which still operates today in my community and um, is very strong. There are just two there are two systems of law operating in Australia concurrently, even though they're not rec if, if one is not recognised, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So um, the actions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people during that period were acts of within their system of law. Um, and yeah. Look, uh, for me, I, I've never seen any framed that way in this country, right? Framing our, our laws in, in, a, in a positive and in a forceful way that they were breached, which I think really, um, you know, for me, it's quite mean. And then I was thinking what would um, some of the lecturers that taught me would think about the way that was framed. And, uh, so I think. It, it is a real good um, series to watch um, for Australians to really have a think about, about the way you frame it and, and, and exactly what it means to Indigenous Australians. And, and, and it's not, um, I mean, it's confronting, but it, it, it's a real um, positive way, I think. And um, I, I really actually got a lot out of it, um, to be honest. And I, and I, and I, I would recommend it. To everyone to, do, to watch it. And, um, again, I've, I've never, as an Indigenous person, who studied in this space, you know, seen anything like that on TV. So I, I want to thank you for that personally. Um, yes, but it nearly killed me, maybe. So. <laughs> <laughs> but you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, look, in the series, you, you visit sites of massacres and speak to descendants of survivors. In, um, include massacres in Victoria here, yeah. and, and particularly the Kundramara people on their country around around Portland. Um, one of the real affecting moments in the series is when you visit the National Museum or Australia Archives with um, senior Dara woman uh, Glenda Chalker and, and her granddaughter, and they and they see for the first time the ancestral remains um, of their ancestors who uh, happened in, the, in that massacre. You also engage with other um, families, your own families, um, of this violence. What, what conservations are you hoping the film will respond in relation to the return of ancestral remains held by museums and institutions such as the University of Melbourne, who um, are, are renowned to have uh, ancestral remains still here yeah. and, and overseas to see? Yeah, it's a big question. Um, it's a big issue in Australia. I, I think the, seri the important thing of the series was not to weaponise it further, you know, and it was meant to draw people in rather than push them away. Because obviously it's so easy to create more conflict, talking about conflict, and what we're trying to seek is resolution. Um, so in the series we interviewed a non-Indigenous woman who's great, great, great grandfather was involved in, as a soldier, as a marine, in a massacre, and then the great, 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 you know, granddaughter of a woman who survived that same massacre, and we have them both talk about it, and then, yes, they visit um, the National Museum where the remains of three people um, who's, who were beheaded um, are there in, in cardboard boxes um, stored in their facility, and yeah, originally she didn't want to do it, but then she decided to do it. I'm really pleased she did because it's a very emotional scene for her, and there's nothing like seeing, you know, the, the skulls in the box of a, of a um, from a uh, military operation that the governor has um, directed to occur to bring the realities of this situation into the present and the fact that these remains are still there um, shows you how these issues are unresolved. Um, in the US, there is an act, I think it's called NAGPRA, which I can't remember the acronym and what that stands for, but it's, um, empowers, it, it, it empowers the American government to ensure that all uh, remains of ancestors and old people belong to the Native American people. 
and um, we don't have that in Australia, but patchwork of um, laws around that, and um, Victoria probably has the best in that First Nations ancestral domains of Indigenous belong to the Victorian Aboriginal Heritage Council at least, um, and then from there they do the patchwork and connect you back to their communities, but in most other states they belong to the Crown or the state, and um, there's been a small amount of government funding to the patch it's, it's not enough, really, and everyone is just in this state of um, difficulty dealing with, you know, Aboriginal people dealing with this problem not created by them from collectors um, accumulating these vast holdings of Aboriginal ancestral remains that some are unprovenanced, some are, you know, it's a very difficult situation. There's a lot of diversity of opinion in the Indigenous community about how to deal with them, whether to um, expose them to DNA testing so that we can identify where they're from more, but some people feel like that's not their place, it's not their ancestors, how can they prove that happens? So it's a very difficult situation. Um, but at the, we, we try to deal with that by developing a paper on where it's at now, what the funding is, just, and then we're going to try and take a policy forward um, to this government to uh, deal with this. Thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of ancestral remains that held in institutions in Australia and overseas. Yeah, thanks um, for that. I mean, there's, as I said, there's, um, there's still some remains in, in this university. Yes. Um, as we, as also a lot of here, um, we're building our um, cultural centres and the discussion here, bringing our bones. Back, just from Australian um, holding places like museums and that, and, and, and the discussion is usually um, very defensive. Um, and um, as, as you know, a lot of our people are, are, are really upset in regards to having our people off country and, and in boxes and big sheds. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the work that you and others do in regards to re repatriating our people back. It's phenomenal, and, and, and again, it's yeah, indigenous people who are in remote locations and, and, and want their people back. It's, it's, it's great that um, people like yourself are doing that work. So, just want to say thank you for that. Um, so, the, this, the story begins and ends at the Australian War Memorial, uh, and, and com commenting on the silence on the warfare fought in this country to establish the Australian state. One of the important impacts of the film is that the AWM has now committed to developing our pre-1940 exhibition, uh, which includes a frontier warfare. Can you tell us about this journey and the AWM's participation in the film? Yeah, so um, the documentary series finishes with the question of, you know, will you include frontier conflict um, in your exhibition spaces? Because at the moment they have, uh, they only include it to the extent that they feature stories about Aboriginal servicemen and women who uh, was in some way engaged with frontier conflict as survivors and then chose to join the Australian Defence Force. So they have a very narrow definition of how they're included. Um, and, uh, and although they tighten the act about 10 years ago, narrowed it very deliberately to exclude frontier warfare. Um, and there are some veterans who feel, and you know, veterans have their views, and, and there's a diversity of views, but there are some veterans that feel that, you know, that space is a place of honour for people who fought for Australia in the Defence Force, and that is a very proud thing, and we shouldn't tarnish that with bringing conflict in that um, was not was not appropriate. Um, so that's that's why some veterans feel that that's that's very reasonable um, view. But my view is that it's called the Australian War Memorial and um, there were possibly as many dead in the frontier wars. Um, not that it's about counting bodies because we'll never know, but it was as extensive um, as, as the wars um, Australians have fought for overseas. So, you know, 
at one point we said, well, why don't you just call it the a war memorial for wars that happened overseas? And take the name off the front of it, because otherwise it's not representing what happened here. So anyway, but Kim Beasley is the new chair. Um, there is a new approach, and in fact, I was on a Zoom call with staff today as I was getting on the plane about how to um, approach this uh, the exhibition and discussion of this within the War Memorial and we just got some money from a donor to give grants for the writing of Frontier History and we're going to do that in partnership with the War Memorial. So um, it's very much trying to build this I'll come to you without asking you about the, um, the voice. Yes. <laughs> so it's, so as co-chair of the Yes23 campaign, uh, what does the voice of pilot mean to you and, and can you tell everyone why we need one? Um, so this is something that Indigenous people have talked about, you know, William Burrow talked about it in Victoria in some ways about talking about freedom and a voice uh, that he was not able to have for his people um, in the 18 mid 1830s to 1880s, um, it's always been a struggle for our people to be heard and um, throughout the last 230 years. So this is not a new issue. Um, and uh, when Australia became federated, um, the constitution was written without any Indigenous people involved and it deliberately excluded Indigenous people. Um, because in section 5126, which is called the race power, the new Commonwealth government was given the power to make laws about any race, and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people were excluded from that. So it was just the states that could make laws about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, and then the 1967 referendum, um, which my father was involved in shortly after the Freedom Ride, um, uh, and, and many others, it was a huge movement, um, led to the, our inclusion under the race clause and so the Commonwealth Government's been making laws about us ever since. I think there's 21 specific laws that um, are in relation to Indigenous people at the moment and that the Commonwealth has. So um, what the referendum proposes is, is two things um, and it's, it's, a, it's a request from Indigenous people, although some Indigenous people clearly don't support constitutional recognition and that's fine. Um, we know that uh, over many years, Reconciliation Australia has looked at the support of this from Indigenous people and it's around 86%, which is a very large consensus over a long period of time. So what Indigenous people have asked for, which um, is uh, articulated in the Uluru Statement from the Heart, is this constitutional recognition would take the form of a voice. So it's twofold. It's the recognition in the constitution of the long history and governance of First Nations over deep time. That's the recognition part. And the recognition is asked for in the form of a voice. So it's twofold recognition. Recognition of us as a people, as peoples, and that we have a practical outcome to that recognition. That is a voice <coughs> to both Parliament and the executive. Very important to have both um, because uh, if we have only a voice to parliament, it's right at the end of the process, and actually, um, we need the voice to the executive because, as we know, it's in the bureaucracies that the policies and the laws are shaped and with ministers. So, we need the voice to be able to speak to both to make it effective. Um, so, the voice is designed to be a regional grassroots voice that comes up to a national <coughs> body. Um, so that it can speak to the diversity of um, Indigenous people. And it's got a number of principles <coughs> behind it at the moment um, because we haven't done the legislation for it yet. Um, but we know it will have gender balance, um, that it won't fund programs, that it won't have financial decision-making powers and other things. So it's an advisory body, yes. It's not as powerful as some people would like it to be, but it will have two things. One, it will have the weight of the Australian people behind it, which gives it moral weight that hopefully will give it respect that we have not been granted to date. 
by our politicians, and second, um, it will be enduring. Having it within the Constitution makes it an enduring, essential element of our democracy, and hopefully that as well will give it more respect than has been granted to us in previous iterations of advisory bodies. And that enduring nature is very important because in my lifetime we've had five advisory, bod five advisory bodies started and shut down, start and shut them down, start and shut it down. It's like setting up Melbourne University every five years, <laughs> shutting it down. They're just setting up, oh, let's set it up again, oh, let's shut it down. So, you know, it just, um, we want a enduring body of policy, um, research, you know, governance that remains into the future. So whilst Parliament can decide the format and composition of the course, they must always have that voice and they must consider the advice. So that's what we're asking for. That's what we need a successful referendum for, um, which will probably come in about 150 days. So there is very little time. And uh, after that is achieved, then we will move to the next part of the new status, which is treaty and truth. No worries. <laughs> you can ask a question later. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were speaking with Lee Sales recently, uh, um, and you called the voice department proposal almost so modest that it's embarrassing. Yeah, I should, probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you Well, it is, you know, I mean, it is so modest. Like, that's the extraordinary contradiction we find ourselves in, right? On one side of the spectrum, you've got, you know, the, the progressive no, rightly saying in some ways that, you know, this is just an advisory body, come on, you know? What about uh, things like, you know, seats in Parliament, like they have in Aotearoa, New Zealand, etc., right? And, you know, they can just ignore the advice, right? So that's, that's extreme, saying so it has no power, it's, you know, it's rubbish, basically. And then on the other side, you've got the conservative, you know, saying, it's bringing apartheid to Australia, it's going to slow down democracy, it's going to undermine the sovereignty, it's going to have a veto, etc. So you've got these two views on either side, and actually, when you explain to people what it is, oh, okay, it's 35 regions probably, you know, they'll elect a national voice, the national voice will get together maybe in Canberra every quarter or something, they'll give some policy, they'll give some advice, you know, people go, is that it? And you go, yeah, that's it. It's like the productivity commission or something. Um, it's, and, you know, there's all these advisory bodies that can't really exist. And, and that's why sometimes I feel, even though I'm advocating for it, I do feel embarrassed because it is. It's 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 not. It's not you know going to have primacy over the parliamentary process. You know it is so modest, but the thing is that it has the support of the Australian people. And that's what gives it its power and strength, and hopefully politicians will regard it for that. And it's enduring. So you know, it's it's. Therefore, it's, it's quite an elegant solution because it upholds the constitutional, it upholds law, it upholds the democratic process of one person, one vote. You know, it keeps everybody equal in front of the law, but it does have a power in that it needs to be heard and must be heard. So, and it has the moral way of constraining people. So it's, it's trying to find a way to we put ourselves in the democratic um, process of the nation um, permanently, and hopefully, as it as it as time goes by, you know, when we're all gone, hopefully that voice will be respected and admired, and will reflect, you know, the true identity of the country. I hope. Thanks for that. Um, just, just I'm speaking to the um, big bar next week. Um, and it's like a um, CP, a continuing professional development for lawyers. And, and this was, I said yes, I did say no. And um, they recently, it's, uh, it's there's been a huge drama with um, the Victoria Bar. Yeah, that yeah. some of them don't uh, want it. Very few. Yeah. So, 
And then I end up in the Australian saying that um, myself and a colleague here, um, Cheryl Saunders, are, are going to get there to persuade people to vote yes. And geez, I, I, I'm honoured that they think I'm going to be able to persuade their members <laughs> to vote either way. Um, so it, it's, it's really interesting um, where the discussion goes. Um, and I, I, I like you, I'm, I'm a former. I was on ATSIC, so you know, I really know what the, um, the hiatus of having a um, grassroots representation um, pushing up. Yeah. Um, and, and, and I was on my regional chair, I, I, I was a, the, the, the chairman of it, had nine women on the board <coughs> out of 13. So Indigenous people are, are happy to vote for our women who, you know, have a strong voice in our families and, and, and making decisions. So, um, and that's what's been a mess for a long time. Yeah. Um, and I think, I think the practical <coughs> side of it as well uh, is yeah. allowing our people to, to, to be able to speak on behalf of the issues that we know about because yeah. they affect us. And that was whoever in regards to what's best for our people. Yeah. So I really thank you. I know it's a tireless job and. Um, you know, we do have some vocal families and, and our own family members, so um, it, and, and it's not a very uh, rewarding job at times, but overall I think people from the, from the community are, are, are hoping that we, we get a uh, best vote. So, yeah. so, so thank you. Um, just one more before I hand out to the um, audience. Um, lately in the news has been a lot in regards to stand rent and racism. Mm. Um, you work in that environment, um, and you know we, as Indigenous Australians, we all face um, constant, um, you know, bias, um, value, values against some of our people and ourselves. Um, how, how do you see that at the moment in regards to stand as you work in that environment, but also you as a strong um, Indigenous woman? Is push through a, you know, a, in your area and become you know, who you are. Well, I left the ABC. I used to work at the ABC when I was a long time ago, 25 or something. And um, I was trying to pitch programs uh, there, and um, I put up a great <laughs> comedy show. And um, the person said to me, who was the commissioning person, said to me, "It was humour. It's too Aboriginal." I was like, yeah, but I'm the head of the Aboriginal unit, right? We meant to make Aboriginal humour, but that's our job. Anyway, so I just left, right? Because I just thought they don't get it, and actually, I don't. I'm not. I'm not going to sit in this institution that has a glass ceiling. So I'm leaving, and um, because they just didn't have the ambition uh, or the understanding of where I wanted to take Indigenous content, and. Um, and that was a good thing to do. So um, institutions, you know, uh, need to change, and they are changing, I think, and stand needed more support, and um, you didn't get it, um, but they've apologised for what they've done. But it is also hard for the ABC to control what's going on in the community and the hideous shit that people have to put up with. Um, uh, and I think the referendum, like marriage equality, brings all of that shit to the surface. Um, and we're seeing that, you know, on social media and in the newspapers. Piers Ackerman wrote the most revolting piece the other day and said that basically just boys are savages. Um, so, yeah, the voice is sparking all those conversations and it's going to be like that for the next couple of months. So we just have to know that that's going to happen and that's not going to get in our way. We will forge ahead and we will succeed. And those people, the victory will be so sweet, more sweet because of it, because we will just put them all in the dustbin of history. <laughs>